All right, let's go to the book of Amos. The book of Amos. Now, remember, this coming Sunday night, we're having the Lord's Supper, and uh, we'll be, be bringing you a message on the Lord's Supper. But I uh, was going to do this this past Sunday, and of course, we had our missionary. I enjoyed him, enjoyed fellowshipping with him. And uh, we went out, and man, we went to a fancy restaurant, uh, Wendy's, and uh, had a burger. And uh, we enjoy, I enjoyed his fellowship talking to him. I asked him, I said, Brother, how old are you? What would you guess? He's 33. Well, some of you already knew that. You asked him probably. He's 30, 33 years old. And uh, so we need to pray for those folks in Haiti. And uh, let's remember, Brother, um, I was going to say Caruso. <laughs> Gresso, Robinson Gresso, and uh, he, he's a good brother in the Lord and doing a great work. All right, I've talked enough to get you to where you can find the book of Amos. Are you, are you there? I was kind of rambling on and rambling on so that, uh, you know, say, I hope you don't start yet. I haven't found it. All right. Amos chapter number six. Amos chapter number six, and we'll look at verse number one. We've been doing a uh, a book of the Bible every Sunday night, but because of the missionary, we didn't, uh, couldn't do it that night or last Sunday night. So we've been taking a Bible, uh, Bible book, and then the next book is what? What's the next book, Brother Bill? Obadiah, isn't it? <laughs> Brother Bill probably finish up Obadiah. I'm trying to find something in there. I know there's, there's you know, the Bible's a great book. And a wonderful book, and there's so many things in there to, uh, to study and to preach. Uh, Brother Bill's just about preached out the book of Obadiah. I'm looking, so maybe he'll lend me some of his notes or something. I'll follow up, but anyway. All right. So he's going to be finishing probably um, on Sunday school, uh, the Sunday school hour, the book of Obadiah. But in the meantime, we're in chapter 6, verse number 1. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Father, please help us as we study this precious book, this precious verse. Uh, give us an insight. Give us what we need tonight. We pray for our nation. We ask, dear God, that you would be with America. I pray that America would repent, turn back to God. I pray that our churches would repent and turn back to God. You told churches in the book of the Revelation to repent and do the first works. We ask dear God that you'll help us tonight. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. There is a phrase in here. It says, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Now, in a good sense, in a good sense, it is uh, to be at ease is a good thing if you're at rest or at ease in Christ Jesus. In fact, Jesus invites us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And according to Hebrews chapter number four, we as Christians, if you've trusted Christ as your savior, you've already entered into that rest. You know what? <clears throat> there, there are lots of people that are trying to work for their salvation. And they cannot be at ease knowing that probably, and if they really believe that they're working for their, their salvation, they cannot lay their head down at night and wonder, did I do everything I needed to do? Now, I, I'm just going to tell you, we fall short of the righteousness of God. The Bible says that. But if I, if I have put my trust in Jesus Christ, we sing this old song, Jesus what? Paid it all. All to him I owe. I, look, tonight I'm going to go to, well, hopefully I'll go to sleep. But tonight I'm going to lay my head down. I am not going to worry about whether or not I'm going to heaven. That's been settled. When I was 14 years old, I trusted, received Jesus Christ as my Savior my salvation is settled. Right. I'm going to go to heaven. Not because of what I did, but because of what he did. Right. And so I'm at ease in Christ when it comes to salvation. Right. 
By the way, I'm at ease when it comes to him keeping me saved. I, I can't keep myself saved. Are you kidding me? I can't go through Walmart with having bad feelings toward people. <laughs> Why don't they get out of my way? <laughs> you know, Man, I went through there. Uh, every time I go, I hit the parking lot and I said, now, Lord, you got to help me. <laughs> you know how it is with me and Walmart. <laughs> and so first thing I walk in there, I didn't get through the doors. And there's, there's two people right there. There's one with a motorized chair and there's another one with a buggy. And they're standing, they're right in the way. I mean, the aisle ain't but about like what it is. <clears throat> and I'm standing there and they're just standing there talking. And I go, <clears throat> And they just keep on talking. And I said, <coughs> and they kind of look at me. And they just keep on talking. Finally, I say, excuse me. I like to get through. And uh, anyway, uh, I won't tell you what else I uh, thought. But, uh, you, but anyway, you know what? Look, uh, if, if I would have lost my salvation, it would have been right there. You can't lose your salvation, folks, any more than you acquired it by yourself. So I'm glad that I'm at ease, not only when it comes to being saved, but staying saved. Now, I do not advocate, look, look, I've heard people say, well, well, if I believe like you do, I'd just sin all, all I want. I said, well, I do. I just don't want to sin like I used to. And so, you know, when you get saved, God changes your want to's. And you're a creature in Christ now. And I can lay my head down and I can confess my sin. If we confess our sins, the Bible says in John's writing, he says, if we confess our, he includes himself. He's faithful and just, Jesus is, to forgive us our sins and the what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One preacher used to say, just keep short accounts with God. You can't lose your salvation. You can't lose it. It's a birth. You cannot get unborn again. So I laid down my head tonight knowing that I'm saved, knowing that I'm going to be saved forever. And so I'm at ease with that. And there's other things. I'm at ease knowing that, God's, that God will provide all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I, I, look, <clears throat> I'm not going to worry about starving to death. I'm not going to worry about God neglecting me. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm at ease with that. I really am. I don't know if you are or not, but I am. I'm, but you know why? Because I'm at ease with this book. Because I know it to be true. I know that God has never lied to me. He will never lie to me. Nor does he ever plan to lie to me. I'm at ease. Look, I know. By the way, I don't understand everything in this book, but I sure believe it. I'm like what one preacher said. He said, I don't understand that everything that I eat turns to uh, blood cells and fingernails and skin and all that. He said, I don't understand none of that. He said, but I don't, uh, I don't quit eating because I don't understand it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. You keep reading this old book. God will let you know what you need and that, at that particular time. Well, I didn't mean to say all that, but I did anyway. Okay. In a good sense. To be at ease in Christ. But there's a bad sense that you can be at ease. And that's what we see here in this verse. It says, whoa. That's the first word starts out, right? Whoa. He didn't say happy. happy. He didn't say happy to them. He said, whoa to them that are at ease in Zion. So this word is often used and is used in our text in a bad way. Now, the wicked, the unsaved, the unbeliever cannot have the rest that you and I have as Christians. They cannot have that. They are, the Bible says, or they don't have that rather. The Bible says they're like the troubled sea, which cannot have rest, which, uh, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. And let, let me show you something. Hold your place here. And let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. God is warning Israel here about not hearkening, not listening, and not obeying his word. So in Deuteronomy chapter number 28, if you look at verse way down to the end of the chapter, pretty close, verse number 64. Verse number 64. Deuteronomy 28, verse number 64. All right. 
And the Lord shall scatter thee. And the Lord shall scatter thee. That is, if, if, when they disobey, or if they disobey, the Lord shall scatter thee among all people. From the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt, or among these nations shalt thou find no ease. You see that? Thou shalt find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. The ease in our text, when we go back to Amos, the ease that he's speaking about here is a carnal ease. It's a fleshly security. It's almost like the ease of the people who boarded the Titanic. And they said even God could not sink this ship. They were at ease when they got on. But they ceased to be at ease when the thing come down. When it hit that iceberg. And so here this ease that we're looking at, it's in a bad sense. It's a carnal, fleshly ease. It's the ease of one who has grown calloused and who's grown cold and careless and hardened like Pharaoh did, like Pharaoh did in, in Exodus. It's, it, it's, an ease, um, it's an ease of one that thinks he or she is in total control. One of the phrases that you hear a lot of people say is this, I've got this. You ever hear them say that? They say that quite a lot. Well, I've, I've got this. You don't have anything if God don't want you to have it. But a lot, of think, a lot of people think that about their life. I've got this. I, I'm telling you what, um, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how people have so much confidence in their flesh when they're 20 and 30 years old. It's a different story when you start to turn 50 and 60 and 70. You don't have too much confidence in the flesh, do you? Especially when your kids are saying, Daddy, don't get up on the roof and try to clean out them gutters anymore. I say, so why not? I feel like I can do it. Yeah, but you know, you might fall. I said, well, anybody could fall. I understand what they're thinking, but... Uh, well, let's look at a few things here. In uh, Amos chapter 6, a few things about these uh, folks who are at ease in Zion. First of all, they're presumptuous. They're presumptuous. In other words, look what they trust in. Woe to them that are ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. Now, if you'll, if you'll hold your place here and go to John chapter 4, something will be familiar to you as we look at the woman at the well. John chapter number 4. Let's just turn there because we're coming back to Amos. They trust in the mountain of Samaria. Is it becoming familiar to you just a little bit? Look what she says here. In verse number, in verse number 17, the woman answered, talking to Jesus, of course, and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, whom he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that thou sayest truly, or saidst thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now look what she says. Our fathers worship, now where is she from? Yeah, look what it says here. It says in verse 5, verse 5, or verse 4 talks about Jesus. He must needs go through Samaria. Then he comes to the city of Samaria. So Jesus is in Samaria. Samaria. This woman is a Samaritan. And so here's what she says. She says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So they are trusting in the mountain of Samaria. Look, Samaria was the headquarters of its religion. Jerusalem was the headquarters of of the Jews religion. So this woman says we worship in Samaria, we worship in this mountain of Samaria, you worship in Jerusalem. And so the, the writer here is that uh, God is saying woe to them that are ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. In, uh, in other words, 
They're trusting in they're trusting in a city. They're trusting in a place instead of trusting in a person. You know the layout of see in church in in Revelation. The layout of see in church presumed to have everything, and they said we we don't have need of anything. You know, there's a lot of presumptions made. Isn't there? And so here was one of them. Here was one of them. They said, our, he, he, he said, we trust in the mountains of Samaria. All of our, <clears throat> the Bible says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If you are presuming upon how good you live or how moral you are, that's a wrong presum uh, presumption. God in fact, you know, the Bible says if we do everything that we're supposed to do, which we don't, but if we would, if every one of us or if any one of us would do everything that we're supposed to do, we're still unprofitable servants. That's what the Bible says. So it, when a person presumes to be Righteous, they look, God will never accept anything short of perfect righteousness. Our, our fig leaf religion is not going to do it. Uh, the fruit of the ground offerings of Cain is unacceptable to the Lord. So here they're trusting in the mountain of Samaria. And then there's another thing being at ease will do. Now they're procrastinators. Look at verse number three. Look at verse three. Look at that first phrase here. Ye that put far away the evil day. Well, that's what they said in Peter, didn't they? They said, they said well, Jesus not coming. They've been, they had been talking about Jesus coming back in our, four, our forefathers talked about Jesus coming. He hadn't come yet. Well, they made it. Uh, they did that about Noah too, I'm sure. Yeah, Noah, it's going to rain, huh? Everybody get out your umbrellas. No, uh, I'm going to tell you what. God shut that door. They waited there for a while. Can you imagine the, the crowd out there just jeering at them and making fun of them? And, and boy, that first drop came. Second drop came. We used to... Uh, we, 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 we work construction, and uh, man, sometimes we wanted it to rain. It got so hot out there. We, we just want, we just so tired. So what we would do, we would draw a big circle in the sand or a sidewalk or something right there. And if it got more than 12 drops in that circle, we quit. <laughs> we weren't even union. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, can you imagine Noah and his family and God in that ark? And it started to rain. And boy, it started to pour. And then the Bible says that the ground burst forth. I mean, the aquifer came up, didn't it? And uh, as I'm just telling you, look what he said. Ye that put far away the evil day. People still doing that. That's, oh, yeah, we heard about Jesus. He's coming. Yeah, they, we, my granddaddy preached that. My daddy believed that. No, he, it's way down there. It's way down the road. He could come tonight. He could come tonight. And so the Bible says that now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. In fact, look at, uh, hold your place again. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. No. Ecclesiastes, and then Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Now remember, here, here they said... Ye that put away, or put far away the evil day. The evil day. Now look at chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember now, thy creator, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You know, Solomon, <clears throat> Solomon, um, he was a pretty good expert on the life under the sun. He wasn't so smart about marriage. 
But he did know what it was to be living under the sun. He knew what it was to have riches. He knew what it was to not be satisfied with riches. He knew what it was to have material wealth and all that. And here's what he said. He's speaking to young people. He says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not. <clears throat> you know what Solomon said when he, when he had all this stuff? He had the riches, he had the women, he had the wine, he had the song, he had the entertainment, he had the palaces, he had everything he wished for. And here's what he said, therefore, I hated life. He just hated life. So when he writes to these young people here, remember now that I created the days that I youth, while the evil days come not. What, what, are, what are those evil days? What do you think those evil days I think those evil days are days not necessarily mean, evil like we think of. I think they're days of responsibility. Man, you live in mom and dad's house. They're buying you clothes. They're paying your cell phone bill. You got a car to drive. They wash your clothes. They do this and that. Then all of a sudden, you decide, well, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of getting tired around, just staying around the house. I think I'm going to get out on my own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did that one time. Boy, I, I snuck back at the house every time Daddy went to work and said, Mom, can you wash these clothes? There? I've been wearing these things for three or four days in a row. And uh, she said, yeah, but don't you, don't you tell your Daddy that, you, <laughs> that I did that. So Mama would take care of me. But here's what I'm saying. You get out of the house, guess what? You get your first cell phone bill. And you get your first power bill. And the rent's due. And the washing machine breaks down. And something goes wrong with the plumbing, right? <laughs> Those are the evil days. Man, these things, you know, the easy way's gone now. You're on your own. That's what you wanted. Right. <laughs> Man, I'm just telling you, you better, uh, you better think about some of this stuff. Well, they're procrastinators. You know, many of God's people are under self-delusion. Self-delusion. How many of you heard of Spurgeon? Everybody heard of uh, C.H. Spurgeon. Here's what Spurgeon said about procrastination. He said, procrastination is the greatest of Satan's nets. In this, he catcheth more unwary souls than in any other. Just putting things off. Well, God's not coming yet. He might come, he might come in three seconds. He may come before this night is over. We don't know. You say, I got a long ways to go. I got a long time to live. I got a long, I need to sow. Uh, by the way, there, people say, there's time enough. People say, I haven't done all I want to do. People say, I, I still have a few things on my bucket list. Never didn't know what a bucket list until somebody explained it to me. You want to do this and that before you kick the bucket. But that rich farmer in Luke 12, you remember what he said? In Luke 12, the rich man who owned the farm bought the farm that night, didn't he? That's another saying, right? What happened to him? He bought the farm. Well, how much did he pay for it? his life and so we talk about procrastination why, why, why don't people get saved when they know that they're lost and they know that they're on their way to hell and they, they know that they're not gonna they can't promise you tomorrow Agrippa, Agrippa said almost Paul thou persuadest me to be a Christian and Felix come along and he says I, I'll do this but I need a more convenient season, just not the right time. You know, when God comes, when Jesus comes, he's not going to check with me first if it's okay. You got something you got to do, Jerry? Well, I'll put it off. No. Uh -uh. When he comes, he's going to come. He's going to come. Well, those who are at ease in Zion, they're presumptuous, they're procrastinators. There, there's, look, there's something else here. Verse number three again. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near. They persevere in their sins, though at the same time they pay homage to God. In the house of God. Now, I want you to think about something. 
You can't be a seat holder in church and a seat holder everywhere else. You can't eat at the table of the Lord and the table of devils, the Bible says. Look, in first in first John chapter number three, verse number three. I'm gonna turn there and read that, but you can turn there if you'd like, or jot it down, but hold your place here in Amos. First John chapter three. Now listen to what it says. It talks about the coming of the Lord. He said in verse 2, Beloved, now we the sons of God, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <clears throat> now watch. And every man that hath this hope, what hope? The coming of the Lord Jesus. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Do you know what you'll do if you're looking for Jesus to come back just any time? Man, you're going to keep yourself straightened up. You, 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 and, and that's what he's talking about here in verse number 3. And cause the seat of violence. Something has to give. And many have given their place to the devil. In fact, the Bible says that. Neither give place to the devil. And, and God and, and the Lord is writing to save people when he says that. Can you give the devil your place? People do all the time. Christians do all the time. I, th I think about people who get upset, get mad, leave a church for whatever reason. I mean, if, if they leave a church because of false doctrine, that's another story. If they leave the church because of immorality in the congregation, that's another story. But to leave on something very, very trivial. Anytime somebody leaves our church, and it hadn't been for a while anyway, but anytime somebody leaves our church, I'll, I'll give them a call. I said, uh, I hadn't seen you for a couple of weeks. We're not coming back. I, and here's what I say. I don't say why. I say, what doctrinal reason do you have for leaving our church? Amen. Well, it's not doctrinal. Then I said, then why are you leaving? How many of you ever, how many of you ever got a, a bad carton of milk at the store? I mean, raise your hand. You, you got a bad carton of milk, Okay. Did you quit going to the store because you got a bad carton of milk? No. You probably went somewhere else. Here's what I'm saying. There's a lot of people that, that are at ease in Zion because they consist, they, they, can, they, they want to continue in their sin and yet pay homage to God. Man, if you're looking for Jesus to come, you're going to try to keep yourself clean and keep yourself pure till he comes. So, so you get a call. You get a call from somebody that's very important and they say, you know what, I'm in the area and I'll be by your house in a couple of days. Well, what time are you coming? Well, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll be by your house in a couple of days. Can you get more specific with that? And you know what you do? You try to clean the house up, try to pick up stuff, dust everything. Oh man, I hope they don't come while I'm doing this. And you know what? Jesus is not going to wait and check with us if we've done cleaned up yet. If you're looking for him, you're looking for him. And if you're looking for him, you're going to purify yourself. And, and, and you're not going to persevere and try to hold on to God and try to hold on to... You, you see what I'm saying? They love their sin more than they love God. It's what they're talking about here. Let's look at the fourth thing real quick. Look at verse 4. That lie upon beds of ivory. Now they're at ease, remember? They're at ease in Zion. They're not looking for, for God to come back. They said it's down the road somewhere, verse number 3. They persevere in their sin, part of verse number three. Then verse number four. That lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. 
that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Do you know what they do? <laughs> Those who are at ease in Zion, they pamper themselves. They pamper themselves. They, they live for self-indulgence. Now, can I get y'all to help me here? Yeah, will y'all help me do something? I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank, okay? I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to leave the last thing blank, and I want you to fill it in, okay? Y'all do that? Here's, here's the statement, and I've heard this several times. Well, preacher, I want a church where I can feel... Who said comfortable? Who thought comfortable? Why didn't you say, I want a church where I can feel conviction? Most people don't want that. They are at ease. Aren't they? Preacher, don't. You know what, Jeremiah, I think Jeremiah Isaiah, one of those prophets. Here's what they said. And the people saying to him, probably Jeremiah, I think it was Isaiah. They said, preach to us smooth things. Don't. Was it Jeremiah? He said, don't, don't give us this hellfire and damnation preach. Preach to us smooth things. <laughs> don't let up a little bit. You know, we got a guy out in Houston that does that all the time. Smooth things, you know. Our modern church, look, their God was their belly. <laughs> they lie upon, can you imagine? Picture yourself going to church, just lying down in these pews. You got a pillow behind your head. Our modern churches, now listen to me. Our modern churches have turned into coffee shops and entertainment centers and have ceased to preach the word of the Lord. They are at ease. We're, we've been looking for a church like this. We've been looking for a church where we can feel comfortable. Honey, pass me a donut. <laughs> At ease. It's not such a good thing. Not here. Not here. These people are like stony ground hearers. That parable Jesus talked about who have no depth of earth and when the seed falls in it springs up and the Bible says it dries up and it does what? Withers away. Well, let's look at another thing here. Look at verse number 6 again. That drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the cheap ointments. Man, they're getting rub downs. <laughs> but they are not, look, they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. People who are at ease in Zion. These people. Our people. The modern church. Are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. What do you mean by that? I mean that most people. Most church people. Are not burdened for lost souls. They're not burdened for missions. I wish you could have talked to that missionary and had a little fellowship with him. His heart's broken for his people. His heart's broken for his people. I, I'm telling you, our church, a church that is not mission-minded, there's something wrong. Something wrong. They're, they're at ease. We don't want to be at ease. We don't need to be at ease in that way. And so they, they don't want a cross to bear. They don't want a burden. They don't want any problems. They are like Moab. You remember what God said about Moab? Moab is settled on their lees. L-E-E-S. Now, I've always wondered about that statement. 
But if you look up that word Lee, L-E-E, it is a calm or sheltered place from the wind. It is the only, look, it, it speaks of the wind, not when it's violent, but when it's nice and cool and comfortable. And God says that Moab is settled on their lees. They like the cool wind. They like the nice breeze. But in this day and age in which we live, in America, we cannot afford to be at ease. We've got to do, like the Bible says, to fight the good fight of faith. We're going to have to take a stand, folks. We preached a lot about it. We preached it for years. But it has never, it has never come to the point at which it has come to now. We're going to have to stand and be accounted for. And so you know what? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to bow down to you like the Hebrew children said. We're not going to worship your image. We're not going to bow down to your music. We're not going to take the food into our bodies like you're trying to make us eat. You know what? God help us to get off of our couches of ease and stand up and be soldiers of the cross. That's what we need to do. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. It's one thing to be at rest and at ease in Christ is another thing, quite a different thing to be at ease in Zion. Let's pray. Father, we ask dear God that you'll help us, Lord, to remember that you went to a cross. That was no easy thing. That you were beaten, that you were bloody, that you hung there naked before the whole world. That was not an easy thing. That you gave your back to those smiters, your cheeks to the smiters. That you hung there on that cross and shed all of your precious blood. Placed a crown of thorns upon your brow, took a spear, pierced your side. And then you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The cross was not a life of ease, was not an instrument of ease. So, Father, I pray that you'll help us to be good soldiers of that cross. Forgive us where we have failed thee. Lord, if there's one here that needs to be saved, I pray that you'd save them. Father, if we're in that spirit of ease, in that bad sense, I pray that you'll forgive us. Help us to turn around, repent of that kind of life and be soldiers of the cross. We ask it in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.